generous of you. Thank you very much. Kia ora koutou katoa, nga mihi nui kia koutou. I welcome you in the language of um, te reo Māori and bring you the warmest greetings of Aotearoa uh, New Zealand. I consider it a, a true honour and a privilege to be joining you here this morning, so I thank you for sharing and spending a, a little bit of time with me. Now, I began preparing my comments for today's event while I was sitting in my constituency office in Auckland, New Zealand. It's a relatively humble space, made all the more so by the fact that I've never quite completely unpacked my office and I still sit amongst quite a few boxes. But on my desk sits a photo of my nana. She died when I was uh, 12 year years old, but was a really staunch member of the New Zealand Labour Party, the party that I am now very, very proud to lead. Now, next to my nana sits a framed image of Kate Shepherd. She was the suffragist who we in New Zealand credit for the fact that women were granted the right to vote in New Zealand 125 years ago. We were the very first in the world. And a framed box sits nearby Kate. It's a letter I received from Hillary Clinton after the 2017 election in New Zealand, and it's signed off with the words, never, never, never give up. And finally, on my far wall sits a cartoon. It's of Nelson Mandela, and underneath it contains his words, quote, overcoming poverty is not a task of charity, it is an act of justice. Now, you could say that the artifacts that I sit amongst in that office really sum up my life in politics. It started with my family. It's been full of role models. But ultimately, it is motivated by the simple idea that politics is a place that you can address injustice. I grew up in two small towns in New Zealand. Given our population as an entire nation is only roughly 4.5 million people, you probably think our entire country is a small town relative to yours, but I'm talking about towns of something like 3,000 people. First town I grew up in was a little place called Murupara, and that place taught me about inequality. I was raised the daughter of a policeman and was the product of the 1980s where New Zealand went through a really rapid period of privatisation and economic liberalisation. Now, in New Zealand, that period was called Rogernomics. It was named after our finance minister of the time. In America, the same or similar phenomenon was known as Reaganomics. And the impact on working families was similar. Now, jobs in New Zealand were lost. Manufacturers moved offshore. Regulations were removed, and the gap between rich and poor grew. Then came the 1990s. A conservative government in New Zealand introduced reforms that brought user pay to the fore and also welfare cuts to the poorest. Now, I was really young when all of this was happening around me, but I still remember it. And if it is possible for you to build your social conscience when you are a schoolgirl, then that's what happened to me. Now, I, I never looked at the world through a lens of politics, though, but rather through a lens of fairness. And that sentiment captures one of the most pervasive values that we have in Aotearoa, New Zealand. We are proud, but also self-deprecating. We are dreamers, but we are also complete pragmatists. And if there is one thing we hate, it is injustice. We try our best to do right by one another. Now, perhaps it comes from being a million miles away from anywhere, isolated and completely reliant on one another. We think that a three-hour flight is a short commute. And we hardly bat an eyelid when it takes 12, if it takes a full 24 hours in the sky just to reach Europe. And don't get me started on 17 hours to get to New York with a three-month-old baby. <laughs> Yet, despite our geographic isolation, we are acutely aware of the impact that we have on the world and that the rest of the world has on us. Now, these are values that 
I believe we need to display in our politics because politics is increasingly a dirty word, but values are not. Values have always been my starting point. I signed up to a political party when I was just 17 years old, not because I was looking for a career, but perhaps naively, I wanted to change the world. I was promptly handed upon joining a political party, 300 leaflets, and sent out to change the world one letterbox at a time. But what does it look like to bring that values-based approach into politics? How do we make the rhetoric meaningful and make sure that we're delivering genuine change for our population? Now, some would argue if you're looking for a long list of values-based reforms, you need look no further than the Sustainable Development Goals, and they would be right. An earnest politician would be hard-pressed to argue with goals like halving poverty and preserving the sustainability of our oceans or inclusive education. And yet, the SDGs haven't been treated as a given. And on a number of measures, I know we in New Zealand have a long way to go too. Now, our response to this challenge hasn't been to create a tick box list. Instead, we have decided to try something no other country has done before and embed indicators like the SDGs into everything that we do. So we've started by redefining what success looks like. Now, traditionally, success or failure in politics has been measured purely in economic terms, growth, GDP, your trade deficit, and the level of debt that you carry. But on those terms, you would call New Zealand relatively successful. But in the last few years, the deficiency of such measures has become stark. We, for instance, in New Zealand have had rates of growth that international commentators have remarked upon and commended. But at the same time, we've also had some of the worst homelessness in the OECD and growing inequality. Now, I don't consider that success. Economic growth accompanied by worsening social outcomes is a failure. So we are establishing brand new measures of national achievement that go beyond growth. We have, for instance, created a tool called the Living Standards Framework. It puts the notion of sustainable intergenerational well-being at the center of the different decision-making processes we have, policy advice, government expenditure, and long-term management of assets. We will start tracking our progress against a range of new and different tools. Our statistics department is at the moment working on an ambitious project called Indicators Aotearoa New Zealand that aims to create a comprehensive set of indicators across dimensions that include current and future well-being of New Zealand, both economic, cultural, social, and environmental. Now, these tools will ultimately help us to deliver and monitor the delivery of the SDGs. Our very first test of the new approach we are using will be next year. That's when we deliver our first budget using these new measures. We've called it the wellbeing budget, and it will unashamedly look to invest in the next generation. But look, all of this is the how. The way we are choosing to work doesn't tell you much about what it is that we will be rolling out. Our agenda for change. For that, I want to reference again the starting point for New Zealand. Now, like many, New Zealand has not been immune to a period of rapid and transformational change over these past few decades. Globalization has changed the way we operate, but has also had a material difference on the lives of our citizens. Not everyone has been well served by these changes. While uh, at a global level, economic growth has been unprecedented, the distribution of benefits has been unevil at the, uneven at the level of individuals and communities. In fact, for many, the transition our economies have made in the wake of globalization has been jarring. Now, as politicians, we all have choices in how we respond. We can whip up resentment, or we can build a response. Now, our choice in New Zealand is action. That's why one of our key priorities is to grow and share more fairly New Zealand's prosperity. 
We're investing more in research and development so that we improve the productivity of our country. We're focusing on shifting away from volume instead to value in our exports, and we're committing to lifting wages. We know we can't fund our social program unless we generate income from exports. So we're supporting exporters, but also workers in the environment by pursuing a new progressive set of free trade agreements and developing a trade for all agenda. We're modernizing our reserve bank so that it works to keep both inflation in check, but also unemployment low. And we're committed to a better balanced and fairer tax system. We also need to do better at lifting incomes of New Zealanders and sharing the gains of economic growth. So we are progressing pay equity settlements with workforces of predominantly women workers. We're taking the pressure off families by extending paid parental leave to 26 weeks. We're closing the gender pay gap and we have already raised the minimum wage and we'll keep raising it right through to 2020. When fully rolled out our families package, a tax credit policy aimed at low and middle income earners in New Zealand, will lift thousands of children out of poverty. But economic gains and growth, they matter for nothing if we sacrifice our environment along the way or if we fail to prepare for the future. It's why we are transitioning New Zealand to a clean, green, carbon neutral economy. That means making the transition to a net zero carbon economy and we'll do that by 2050. Our $100 million green innovation fund will help business to tap opportunities in smart, low carbon industries. We've also launched a program that will see 1 billion trees planted in New Zealand over the next 10 years to support our climate change agenda and generate jobs. That is more trees than sheep, I can assure you. We'll also put an end to new offshore oil and gas exploration permits and have set a goal of having 100% renewable energy generation by 2035. We also need to bring back some authenticity to our clean green image by better managing the waste we produce, investing to protect our unique biodiversity, ensuring our rivers are swimmable for future generations, and we have plans in all of those areas. But of course, we are nothing without our people. Now we've set ourselves some big goals, like ensuring that everyone who is able is either earning, learning, caring, or volunteering, including making the first year of tertiary study in New Zealand completely free of fees. We're supporting healthier, safer, safer and more connected communities. We're ensuring everyone has a warm, dry home. And last but not least, making New Zealand the best place in the world to be a child. Now, this agenda is quite personal to me. I'm the minister, as well as prime minister, for child poverty reduction in New Zealand. Now, I took that portfolio because of the importance we place on lifting tens of thousands of children out of poverty and ensuring that every child, no matter what their background, has their basic needs met and the opportunity to thrive. We are determined to make a difference. This year, we will pass into law the Child Poverty Reduction Bill that will make it a legislative requirement to report on how many children we have lifted out of poverty. We also know that it's not just about family incomes, but whether a child has all their need met, needs met, including good health, a roof over their head, a great education, and perhaps the thing we take for granted the most, time with their parents and their caregivers. If I were to sum up our agenda, though, it would be very simple. I want to demonstrate that politics doesn't have to be about three or four year cycles. It doesn't have to be self-interested or have a singular focus. It can be about long-term challenges, and we can respond to them. It can be designed to think about the impact on others and show that we are making a difference. And it can even be kind. As an international community, I am constantly heartened by our ability to take a multilateral approach, to sign up to a set of aspirations that are values-based. But perhaps it's also time to challenge ourselves to move beyond aspiration to action. I can assure you, that is what we will be doing from our corner of the world. And I can also assure you that we will never, never, never give up.
wonderful. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. I'm getting lots of messages. Wow, wow, wow. So uh, that, that is uh, really fantastic. From your corner of the world, um, could you describe your climate uh, change agenda a little bit? You said you're going to all renewables. How are you doing it? Yeah. And then I want to ask you about your next door neighbor, which isn't quite doing it, uh, and how, how one understands that. You know, I, I think if I were describing our agenda, it's driven out of necessity. Um, you know, we are members of the Pacific, uh, and climate change is not a hypothetical in our region. I recently returned from uh, visits around um, Tonga, Samoa, um, Niue, the Cook Islands, and they had recently had uh, a series of, of severe cyclones. Now, those kind of weather events aren't new um, in our region, but the severity and the frequency is. And when you have someone uh, talk about the fact that the village they grew up in as a child is now at risk uh, of being submerged, then that just really brings home the reality of the situation in our region. Uh, so those islands, our neighbours, they can't opt out of the impact of climate change. So why should we be able to opt out of taking action? Uh, we do have an obligation. And so that really is the foundation for what we're doing. Um, we are already sitting at over 80% renewable energy in New Zealand. We have wind, sun and rain. Um, and that combination, of course, means that when it comes to the energy side of our emissions profile, we're in pretty good shape. Um, what's difficult for us is the agricultural side. Uh, our emissions profile is roughly 50% uh, agricultural emissions. Now, that makes us pretty unique. But one of the points that we've been making as we've been investing in Global Research Alliance, um, doing what we can to try uh, and literally alter the way we farm to reduce our emissions profile, uh, we all have to address that side of the challenge because it comes at the risk to our food security. Uh, and our emissions profile is actually the likes of what other developed nations will face further down the track once they pick off the low-hanging fruit of energy generation and transportation. So we're really at the front line of something that probably other countries like uh, the likes of Ireland, the Netherlands and others will soon face. So we need them to think ahead and help invest in uh, advanced technology, particularly on food production. Fantastic. With Australia, a big neighbour of yours, uh, they are still in the midst of the politics of coal, the midst of the politics of uh, fossil fuels and so on. Any advice for them? <laughs> we only give advice on sporting fixtures like rugby and netball. <laughs> you beat them, right. Yeah. <laughs> Politics, I, 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 we leave to each other. Um, but look, it, it's, not, it's not easy. You know, I, 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 once, I once described um, climate change as the nuclear-free moment for New Zealand. That was a reference to the fact that there was a period in New Zealand's history where we were completely unified behind making our part of the Pacific free of, of nuclear testing. It, it really did unify us. One difference, though, actually, the more I reflect on it is that there was that unity, actually, on climate change. We can all agree about the problem that it presents, but there are huge interests in maintaining the status quo, and they are hard to shift. We recently announced that we would not be issuing any further oil and gas exploration permits in New Zealand. Um, but those are tough calls. Those are industries. Those are jobs. And we have a duty of care to those people who have relied on those industries and those jobs. So I understand what Australia is confronting, what others are confronting, but we have a duty of care to the next generation as well. Could I ask you about uh, uh, identity politics and uh, ethnicity? Because, uh, of course, you have a large indigenous population, yes. a Maori population. Uh, you're at uh, one uh, corner of the so-called Polynesian Triangle, uh, but a major part of uh, Polynesia. You have the politics of migration like everyone else. Could you reflect a bit about New Zealand's special learning about all of that and, and uh, uh, 
I also want, want us to discuss briefly your interesting political coalition because mm. I think it's very eye-opening for, mm. for us. I mean, I could, I could speak for a long time around <laughs> every element of that question. We are one of the most ethnically diverse countries, I'm told, in the world. Um, but underpinning all of that, though, is, is of course, uh, the fact that the uh, Crown's relationship with Māori is underpinned by the Treaty of Waitangi, founding document between Māori and the Crown. So indigenous New Zealanders, um, uh, that relationship is, um, you know, dictates the way that we work as a government. It's incredibly important to us. Uh, and that probably makes us quite unique relative to some, that the existence of that founding document makes, signed in 1840 makes us quite different to others. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, what I would say around issues around migration, I spoke briefly about globalization, the impact that it's had on our economies and our communities. What I sense around the world is this growing sense of insecurity, whether it's financial insecurity, the sense that you, you're not necessarily guaranteed a roof over your head or a stable job or a stable income anymore. And as progressives, we have to respond to that. And the way that progressives respond needs to incorporate our values. It needs to be inclusive. Um, it needs to acknowledge decent wages and decent conditions. And that also needs to, uh, that needs to apply in the way that we treat issues of migration. We've been tackling in New Zealand, in fact, there has been exploitation of our migrant communities. So the reforms that we're going through are very much focused on fixing that side of the ledger because that's a part of who we are. Maybe uh, you could explain a little bit. I find it quite fascinating uh, that the Prime Minister heads uh, a social democratic uh, center-left uh, party. It's aligned with uh, uh, what uh, would be resonant to American ears uh, this year, uh, which is uh, New Zealand first party. Uh, so uh, a kind of America first uh, idea, as I understand it, uh, anti-migrant uh, or close the migration or limit migration. In the United States, our battle is incredibly tough right now, right and left, but the uh, anti-migrant is solidly right. It's aligned with also the corporate interests, and that's the Republican Party. And the uh, Democratic Party, which is uh, our, it passes for left, it's kind of center, uh, but uh, we call it a center-left party anyway, not by your standards, but by our standards, um, is uh, pro-migrant and pro-migration. The idea that these could be in a coalition is uh, almost unimaginable in our politics, but you have a coalition of a progressive social democratic vision yeah. and a uh, limit on migration. And I, like you to explain that to yeah. me and to all of us, because I think it's uh, extremely interesting, actually, in a I very am, different. Uh, yeah, and the third, the third party in our agreement is the New Zealand Green Party. So obviously, right. very um, different, also. Yeah. From, yeah. But it, actually, if you, the, so I'll, I'll paint a little picture for you. In MMP politics, we're similar to the German system. Uh, except we, we managed to negotiate our coalitions in a very short time frame because the New Zealand population get a little impatient with us if we take too long. So we took roughly from memory about two weeks to form our government. But the um, leader of the New Zealand First Party was the one to announce the decision that he'd made between whether or not he would form a coalition predominantly with the New Zealand Labour Party or the um, National Party, the, the more conservative um, party in New Zealand. In his speech that night, when he announced his decision, he talked about all of the things that actually really resonated with the parties he formed ultimately a government with. And they were that our economic system had failed people. And, and look, there's no doubt that it has. When you have economic growth and terrible homelessness, something has gone horribly wrong. And that was the basis of, of the speech that he gave that night. So the things that unite us are founding principles for what we're doing now and our agenda. Uh, and I'd push back a little bit on their behalf uh, as well around some of the sentiment and assumptions that are made um, about them when it comes to population policy. In fact, just last week, we, uh, we essentially um, uh, almost doubled the refugee quota in New Zealand. And we did that as a government together. So, 
But I think what we've managed to do is acknowledge that actually, you know, globally, that issue that I've spoken about, that financial insecurity, that sense of insecurity, that's something that we see that exists in, amongst voters, and it is up to us and how we choose to characterize those threats and how we respond to them. And we choose to say, actually, we have a role to play as governments to fix some of those problems. Rather than blaming any other group in society, we're gonna carry the burden for fixing that. Yes. And that's what we're doing. Great, thank you. Maybe the uh, biggest uh, divide in the world right now geopolitically is uh, also, for complicated reasons, uh, the U.S. Uh, trade war on China and seemingly the U.S. Uh, trying to stoke a, 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 a new divide with China. President Trump uh, in the Security Council uh, accused China of meddling in the elections. Uh, uh, he, at the podium of the General Assembly, uh, talked uh, glowingly about uh, all of the tariffs that he has imposed on China. Uh, for New Zealand, this must not be a very comfortable situation to have uh, your ally on one side, your leading trade partner and regional neighbor uh, on the other, and seemingly uh, this uh, potential high-level conflict rising. And what, uh, what should be done about this? We should stick to the rules, you know, and, and regardless of who's in, engaged, you know, putting that aside for us, you know, for any, you know, small island nation, uh, we rely on predictability, we rely on uh, order, and we rely on the rules. You know, that's probably why you know, from the very outset of the formation of the United Nations, we were there at the table, we saw the benefit of us recognising uh, that responsibility that we had to each other, to our people, but to each other um, as well. Uh, and that's why we're advocates at the WTO. Um, we are sticklers for the rules. Uh, trade wars serve no one, but they do particularly punish uh, smaller uh, nations with perceived lack of power. I say perceived because I do think we need to redefine power. Mm -hmm. Uh, this uh, notion, any sense that um, we retrench and instead base our power around the size of our economies or the size of our population uh, is really a rejection of multilateralism. And I push back on that because there's something leveling about those institutions and rightfully that has been built up over time. Uh, and I will defend to the hilt uh, the role that multilateralism can play in solving our global problems and the need for us each to stay at the table. How do you think you can make a strong coalition for multilateralism when it is under such threat now from unilateralism in this country or in other big countries? But there are still examples. If I were to give a seed of hope, there are still examples of where it is still working. It's still happening within the UN. You know, we have seen uh, the application of sanctions around North Korea, you know, there, ha there are examples where it's, it's still working. Uh, and there are examples where uh, we continue, for instance, uh, as a global community in large part to try and uphold things like the Iran Agreement. So there are elements where you see that that um, uh, reinforcement of multilateralism is still, still in play. Uh, we just ultimately, from our perspective, we will continue just to apply the values that we always have from successive governments. And, I'm quite proud of the fact that regardless of political stripes, New Zealand has pretty much maintained a consistent worldview. I, wanted, I was uh, reviewing uh, New Zealand's rankings uh, in uh, our SDG index, and we publish uh, every year also a world happiness report. Uh, you'll be happy to know, it's not a great surprise, uh, New Zealand ranks near the top of the world in both of those. Uh, as a country that is uh, really uh, on course to achieve all of the SDGs uh, if it makes the effort, which is extremely exciting, and also one of the happiest places in the world. So that is also... Uh, the people surveyed were not in politics. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
but you're serving them for their well-being, which is uh, key. But there was one area uh, where uh, New Zealand needs to do more, so I wanted to Go press ahead. you on that on stage. Go ahead. Uh, which is surprising to me, your development aid is rather low as a share of GDP. Uh, it is something like uh, 0.2 of 1%. For the United States, I understand that. We're shirkers. Uh, we are not a responsible country. We're $100 billion a year less than we should be. But I was frankly surprised with New Zealand. I wanted to make a recommendation to you, Prime Minister. Uh, on this stage, uh, no, but quite As long seriously. as I get a right of response. <laughs> uh, could New Zealand reach the 0 0.7 target? And you're a small country, so this is not going to change the world of development aid, but I would say direct it all towards the island economies uh, and make the 0 0.7. And especially, I would do it if I were, uh, and I will make the recommendation, I guess, uh, do it through the learning institutions on the islands so that you're empowering knowledge in local universities and uh, training people so that they can take mm. these challenges on. So I wonder whether uh, that, wouldn't that be a nice progressive way for New Zealand to uh, honor uh, Polynesia and, yeah. uh, and uh, the incredible unique region of the world yeah, well, that you uh, helped and to lead? Look, as it happens, um, in the last budget, uh, we recognized that we needed to boost our international aid and development, um, that we needed to, to do our bit um, so we increased, on top of what we already had, we increased our ODA budget by $700 million. Um, right. And I do, I do want to acknowledge that our foreign affairs minister, uh, the advocate for that significant increase, is also the leader of the New Zealand First Party. Good. So that probably gives you a little bit of an insight into, into that. Um, also, um, I just came from the Pacific Island Forum two weeks ago, um, and look, this is just one of many things, but we just put uh, $9 million into um, uh, education in the Pacific Islands, and that was directed Wonderful. at tertiary institutions. Perfect. So um, we absolutely acknowledge um, the, the role we need to play in the Pacific. A, a large, a significant sum of that additional ODA will go into the Pacific this week. We announced $300 million dollars um, over four years specifically for climate adaptation and mitigation um, focusing on the on the predominantly on the Pacific so that is where our lens so is. we could see you getting to 0 0.7 it's going to take us a bit <laughs> right we are, we are, it's going to take us a bit but we are we're doing our best we're right. doing our best thank you you are uh, an inspiration to uh, young people around the world but especially I think to uh, young I better not stuff it up yeah to, to, to young uh, women politicians and I wonder if you could say something to uh, uh, to the young women in the room about getting into politics and, and your perspective, if I, if I might, as, as a, a, a woman leader uh, for New Zealand, but also really for the world, because you're known, you're admired all over the world. Can I, can I share a personal reflection? Please. Now, I do think that globally, and this isn't speaking to any particular uh, political environment, because I think this is absolutely universal, we need to make politics a more attractive place to be. We just do. And I'm speaking from New Zealand's perspective. Even there, we know that we could do more to just make it a more attractive choice. But beyond that, you know, I have noticed, at least in my country, that when I talk to young women in particular about their aspirations, even from a young age, I sense this hesitance, that there's this almost op opting out. Uh, and I often distill, I make this assumption that it might come down to confidence. And I make that assumption because I was exactly the same. Even though I was totally political, at the age of 17, I never ever assumed that I would become a member of parliament, let alone a prime minister, ever. Even when I was in parliament, you track back through any interview I did, I always rejected the notion of leadership. Now, there were lots of reasons for that, but in part, there's a tendency in young women to say that we don't have everything that it takes, to have that tiny little seed of doubt uh, over amplify in our minds and overtake everything else. And I can tell you that if we continue to allow that to dictate the decisions that we make, 
then we'll be the ones left behind. And that's not right. So yes, we have a huge amount of work to do to make sure we carve a path for women, to make sure our workplaces are more flexible, that uh, there are greater options and opportunities to address unconscious bias. We have to do all of that, but we also have to boost our women's confidence and support them into those roles too and help them overcome those tiny seeds of doubt uh, because if we don't, then we will be all the poorer. So I'm sure priority. you're doing it. Please join me in uh, thanking uh, Prime Minister. Thanks so much. Thank you. Fantastic. Really, <laughs> yeah. really, really great. <laughs>